Welcome to the Valley Today, a public service presentation of the good folks at KAIL-TV. We travel south to Allensworth, a utopian community where African Americans would achieve independence and self-sufficiency. Colonel Allen Allensworth, former slave and military hero, bought 800 acres west of Early Mart and started his dream in 1908. The Allensworth Colony, up next on the Valley Today. Well, welcome to the Valley today. We are at Allensworth State Park and with uh, Steve Toomey here. He's a park uh, interpreter. Correct, park yeah. interpreter. Yeah. And uh, you come from the archaeology field, so... Uh, Correct, I was an archaeologist for close to 20 years here yeah. in the Central Valley. I have an AMA in archaeology and uh, I'm a registered professional archaeologist. And here I'm the uh, interpreter three, the supervising uh, interpreter, and also the interpreter for the district. How many levels of interpreters does uh, the state park system have? Are you, uh, are you at the very top? Yes, yeah. I'm the only interpreter three in the field. Uh, Allensworth is part of a bigger district that uh, encompasses uh, uh, Tahone. Correct, uh, Tatchby District is uh, uh, the central region, I guess, of state parks, if you want to call it that. And we stretch from Allensworth in the north all the way to Lake Silverwood in the south, out to Providence Mountains uh, out on the state line. And uh, we have units that range from state historic parks like Colonel Allensworth and yeah. Fort Tahone. We have a Tule Elk Preserve. We have a California Poppy Reserve, Antelope Valley Indian Museum, uh, Tomokani State Historic Park, which is an Indian rock art site. Uh, we also have Red Rock Canyon, which a lot of people go to to, uh, to enjoy the desert during the winter months. Uh, we have a number of de small desert parks, uh, and then of course Silverwood and uh, Lake Silverwood and uh, uh, the uh, Saddleback Butte, Arthur B. Ripley Desert Woodland, and uh, the uh, Mojave Desert Information You have Center. got, that's a huge district. It takes a long time to get from one end to the other. Yeah. And, and, uh, and are you going to all these uh, I do these most, of, most of the district work I do yeah. from here by computer. And it's mostly reviewing the work of other interpreters yeah. and uh, brochures and pamphlets and keeping track of who's doing what for school programs, that sort of thing, running the statistics. Most of my work is actually here as the supervisor. Uh, we have a pretty full slate of activities and special events throughout the year. Yeah. Uh, in fact, this Saturday coming up is our uh, quarterly Lantern Light Ghost Tour. starts at uh, 8.30 p.m. here at the park, and the cost is $10 per person. And we do that once a quarter with our partners at Portville Ghost Society, and that's been a big hit. We just had a huge ghost event in October. We had Barry Fitzgerald of Ghost Hunters International came and donated his time as, really? to help us raise some money. Yeah. We raised over $1,200 for the park that we'll use for educational programs. Well, that's cool because the, the, the state parks need help. We need help yeah. financially. <laughs> yeah, uh, there are, uh, if you've seen the newspapers, there are 70 state parks that are slated to close starting July 1. Yeah. Uh, you can find those on the closure list on www.parks.ca.gov, and it's only through efforts of, well, the public, really, and nonprofits that are going to help us get through this. Right. So let's, uh, back here at Allensworth, uh, uh, Colonel Allensworth uh, came from the east and came here in... 1908 is 1908. when the town of Allensworth was founded. Uh, he was the highest ranking African American officer in the United States Army and retired in 1906. And only the second man to achieve the rank of Lieutenant Colonel as a chaplain. Chaplains were prohibited from attaining that rank, uh, by actually by regulation. He got a special exemption from the president at the time, and he was promoted to the rank of lieutenant colonel just before retirement. The Army back then didn't really have a very good pension system, so what they would typically do is they would bump you one rank, you'd wear the rank for a few days, and then go into retirement, and you would take that rank into retirement, that higher pay. And then get a higher pay. Yeah, yeah. slightly higher. So he was, a career, he was a career military man. Career officer. He entered yeah. the uh, Army in 1884. 1886, right in that time period, and uh, stayed in until 1906, but also he'd served in the Civil War with the United States Navy from 1863 to 1865. Oh, so he's in the Navy also. Mm -hmm. wow. He was on a river gunboat, Brownwater Navy, uh, sometimes they call them the snapping turtles. Yeah. Uh, working, <laughs> working, working up, yeah, I was oh, We're former the fighting army myself, snapping so, turtles. <laughs> yeah. Um, uh, working up and down the river, uh, basically stopping shipping. Yeah. Uh, and instituting blockades, that type, that type of thing. Right. Uh, and he was a uh, petty officer. He was actually Captain Steward. So how did he get here to uh, this part of California? Well, when he retired from the Army, uh, he was in Manila. He was injured. 
Yeah. Uh, ironically, getting the mail. The horse ran away, jumped free, and he dislocated his knee. Uh, and then he went into a medical retirement. He doesn't, wasn't going to recover, so he went ahead and retired. And he settled in Los Angeles. Well, he met several men there. They got together talking. One of them was Professor William Payne. And he said, you know, we really ought to have a town or a place where we can go where we can live and be ourselves and experience the economic freedom that we were promised. Because even though they were no longer slaves, remember, he was born a slave in 1842. Right. Uh, he'd never seen that economic promises fulfilled. So he said, well, we're tired of waiting. Let's do it on our own. And there's a lot of... Uh, thought around this time period because right around the turn of the century America was changing rapidly yeah. things were changing all the time in 1903 the first transcontinental automobile uh, trip happened the guy went from San Francisco to New York City the uh, radio was just getting uh, started it was already being used in a commercial application as far as uh, on ships and planes that sort of thing the aircraft was starting to take off quite literally um, Small things too, like the breakfast cereals were taken out, the zipper was introduced, phonographs, all this changed. And so they figured they could ride that, and there was a great deal of optimism. So they got together, found the cheapest land they could find, which was here in Tulare County. This all used to be Lake Bottom, it wasn't being used. Uh, it was very cheap. There was a rail line, as you can see on the edge of the park, right. uh, that provided easy access because most people didn't have cars, even though it was found, town was founded in 1908, which is the same year that the Model T became available was first produced, most people were still traveling by horse and buggy uh, or by horseback or train. So had good transportation, there was good water here when they founded the town. There were artesian wells that ran 24 hours a day, seven days a week. And uh, the town of Allensworth was actually situ situated on a, a underground aquifer. It was about two miles wide and about five miles long. So it was a good combination of things at first and they settled the town here. And they said, we're going to do it on our own for us. And it's the only town in California, actually west of the Mississippi, founded, financed, governed, populated, and built by African Americans from the ground up. There were uh, other towns that had started in the west, but typically they were the result of white speculators and or uh, programs of segregation. And that is, you guys live over there. Right. And this was like this utopian community that was being planned from the very beginning. And there were a lot of utopian communities all across the West that were happening right around the same time period. Uh, there were towns in Texas that spoke only German. It was made for German immigrants. Uh, and that actually goes back quite far. And there were other black towns in uh, Oklahoma. There was uh, Boley, Oklahoma. Uh, uh, one of the residents here was a descendant of one of those settlers that tried to found a colony in Oklahoma, uh, Mr. Singleton. So there were a lot of movements like that going on at this time period. So it was not unheard of, but it was the first time that had been tried here. So was he community. able to rally uh, finances through uh, the church? Uh, that's how he got the word out. He started hitting the preaching circuit, if, it, if you would call it that, and hitting all the black churches between Los Angeles and San Francisco, the Bay Area, in California as well as the East, of course, as an army chaplain, he moved around all over the West. Yeah, but Fort Douglas, Utah, Fort Hachuca, Arizona, in Colorado. So he had connections in all those places because wherever he went, one of the first things he would establish would be a school for the soldiers. You know, first grade for privates, second grade for corporals, third grade for sergeants. And uh, he thought it was very important that everyone knew how to read and write and do basic mathematics. Yeah. And a lot of times we don't uh, realize just how critical of a skill that is because back then if you couldn't read it was not uncommon not to be able to read you'd have to take all your correspondence and bills to someone called a, a writer of letters and you would pay someone to read you the letter and then write a response and you'd have to pay for that service and hopefully they'd be honest in their and dealings. hopefully they'd be honest in the dealings <laughs> and so he saw that as uh, my people are at a disadvantage I got to change that yeah and so he got a, a number of like-minded uh, people together in Los Angeles and they raised the money and they uh, founded the California Home Promoting Association to do that as a corporation. I mean, here's capitalism at its best because there was no government loan or government involvement. They just said, we're going to do it because we think we ought to do it. Yeah. And so it's a quintessential American story of the underdog. Someone telling you, I, you can't do that. It's like, well, no, I can. And I'm going to prove you wrong because I'm going to go do it. So how many uh, schools did, uh, did uh, Colonel Allensworth build? Well, this school here... Or, was he have, or did he have his hand in? A lot. Yeah. I mean... He literally founded a school for soldiers at every post he went to. 
uh, you can see trace marks of his uh, skills and teachings in the Army today. It's still being taught. Some of the basic methodology uh, that he established for chaplains are still being used today. But every post he went to, he established a school. It may not be a formal building. Um, this building behind us, the schoolhouse, was built in 1912, and that was built by the community of Allensworth. They got together, formed a bond. It's a standardized plan. There were three other buildings like this in Tulare County. This is the only one that's still intact and still in its original condition. He was a pretty bright guy, wasn't he? He was a very bright man. He finished an entire year of coursework at the Armour Institute of Culinary Science in three months. Wow. So he was a very, apparently a very accomplished cook and restaurateur. He had owned two restaurants in his lives, although he was a very thin man, so I don't know what that says about his cooking, you know. Well, I was always told, well, never trust a, a skinny cook. Yeah, he had a, yeah, he had a fast <laughs> metabolism. Today we're with Steve Toomey here in, uh, at Allensworth State Park, and we are in what, the Heinzman General Store now? Yes, this is the Heinzman General Store. It was yeah. owned and operated by Sarah and Zebedee Heinzman. It was built right around 1911, and uh, he kept it open until 1950. The family kept it open until 1950. Mr. Heinzman kept it open until 1950. Mr. Heinzman kept that's it open until 1950. That's when he died, and that's when the, the uh, store closed. Look. They did not have any children. And actually, he was on his second wife when that happened. Yeah. Uh, his first wife died right around 1940 oh. or so. Yeah. And then his second wife eventually moved away. They started building here in 1908, 1909, yes. somewhere Started in building there. in 1908, and the first settlers who came here, the first pioneers, most of them lived in tents, Yeah. built their own homes, and then it gradually grew. And then about 1918 is when you really start seeing its decline as uh, children started moving away, taking jobs in factories. We also had World War I happened. Uh, the economy starts booming the in the depression cities. is Then the depression coming happens. On. And so farmers that had originally settled here, black farmers, uh, started selling off parts of their property in order to make ends meet, so to speak. Because at, at this period in history, over 15%, uh, somewhere around there, 10 to 15% of all agricultural products were produced by black farmers. Today, it's less than 2%. Yeah. Uh, so you see this general demographic switch because as the Oki migration happens and you have people move out from the Dust Bowl, they get to California and they're willing to work for money for gas, whereas the residents who are over here are saying, well, I can't work for that it's too low, I'm not gonna work for that. Right. The kind of the same thing that we see today with migrant farm workers, as new migrants come in, they're willing to work for less than migrants that have been here for a while. And so you see a demographic switch that happens in the local community as black families move out, Hispanic families move in. Well, Okie families move in, then Hispanic families move in. So really, it had nothing to do with, uh, with the, the people that were here, but it was just all these circumstances that really, and, and there when, was did, a, when did Colonel Allensworth die? Well, he was killed in an accident in 1914 in Monrovia, California. Right. He just finished speaking at a church, stepped out of the uh, uh, rail car, or trolley car, Los Angeles has this great uh, rail car system at the time, and he was struck by a motorcyclist as he was crossing the street. And there were basically four events that happened in a short succession of period that causes the town to decline and eventually fade away. And that was in 1912, uh, California enters its worst drought year on record ever. Still has not been beaten. So the water table here at Allensworth starts dropping. And if you don't have water to farm, you can't be productive. Right. As well as the uh, aquifer that was here that was very high when they moved here, and you had artesian wells, you didn't have to pump. As that water level drops, now you have to bring in gas pumps. And the water system was never fully developed as was promised by the Pacific Farming Company. So your cost for farming goes up because now you're having to pay to pump it. And plus, at the time, you could only pump about 200 feet. Like our, our well here today is about 1,300 feet. Yeah. Uh, so the aquifer big, is big seriously difference. dropped. Yeah. yeah serious difference uh, in, in cost and ability to get water. Then in that same year, about 1913, the uh, Santa Fe Railroad moves the commercial stop that was here at Allensworth to Alpaw. They put in a spur line that's paid by a, and that's a third west party, of here. seven miles west, which is a white community. Now, it didn't, in the end, do Alpaw any good because Alpaw is not much bigger of a town than the current community of Allensworth. They're roughly, population-wise, almost the same. Allensworth is a bit bigger. More, a little bit more was that politically motivated? I'm sure it was politically motivated, and it probably had more to do with the bottom line as far as dollars and cents. Uh, there's been a lot of speculation why that happens. Some people say it's raised. I think it had probably more to do with the money, the influence of the people that had the spur line put in, and they were growing sugar beets. 
And sugar beets was a huge commodity at the time, whereas the folks here at Ellsworth were trying to grow alfalfa. Now, alfalfa right now is very big in the valley because right. of all the dairies. But back then... It didn't it was, have the value didn't that have it the has value. now. Uh, and then, of course, then the colonel dies, and then they lose their bid to build a black college. They had proposed building a black polytechnical institute here, kind of a Tuskegee of the West. Right. And that got shot down in the California legislature, partially because... When the colonel died, he had all the political connections, and he had the, uh, uh, the charisma. He was the dynamic leader. And so when he's out of the picture, there's no one really pushing it as hard. And, of course, politicians generally have short memories. Sure. Uh, he was an elector for uh, James Garfield in the 1884 election for the Republican Party in his home state. So, I mean, he was politically savvy. Uh, but also there was a California Supreme Court decision right around the same time period. I think it came out in 1912 that said segregated schools in California were illegal. So the legislatures used that say, well, it's a segregated school, we can't do it, and destroy it. They went on to the next. How old was uh, the colonel when he died? Oh, he was well into his 70s. Oh, okay. So he was, he was getting he up there in years. He was about 76, 78 yeah. years old in that time period. Hmm. That's a real shame. I mean, yeah, had, had the timing been different, this might have been a real, of, uh, had real viability, right? Very much so. And, and there's actually a lot of controversy surrounding the colonel's death. A lot of people think that he was purposely killed. And there's probably some merit to that argument. Now, we'll never be able to prove it because in history you can't interview those people are dead or right. passed on. Um, it is highly suspicious. I don't think they intended to kill them. I think they probably intended to silence them. To scare them. To scare them off, to saying, you know, we, and I think it revolves, again, around water. You can't talk about California politics or California history without talking about water. Right. And it goes not, it's not just now with the West Side Farmers. It goes all the way back a century. Uh, well, even this Tulare Lake Basin was a big controversy when mm -hmm. they were able to uh, uh, to change it, change the landscape Yeah, here. because the uh, Swampland Reclamation Act that occurred right around this, again, uh, just predating this time period when Allensworth was founded, when that law was passed uh, uh, at midnight when it took effect, there were people waiting to wire in their land claims that knew the bill was going to pass. And so, I mean, you can talk about, you know, Miller and Lux and the Kern County Land Companies and, and those kind of fanglings. And, Basically, it's the same headlines you see today, only the names have changed right. 100 years ago. It's the same kind of yeah. things that were going on. And water is going to be the, the political topic here. It, will it has been, and it's going to be. It always has been. Yeah. yeah. They were going to build a four-year college? Or? A, a, tech, a polytechnical institute. So yeah. it would be a uh, place where African Americans would learn different skills, trades, and labor type of thing. Yeah. Uh, and you have to remember, in 1908 America, or turn of the century America, a barber a uh, cobbler, someone who made shoes, was a middle class occupation. It was not a lower income occupation. It was a, that was sadly in the middle class. It was a trade. Class. It was yeah. a trade because he didn't have automation. And at this point of history, labor is still cheaper than the product. Right. And at some point in history, and it really occurs probably in the 1950s, 1960s, where labor now becomes more than the actual product that you're producing or the uh, raw materials. Because uh, prior to this point in history, before Industrial Revolution, the actual materials was far more expensive than labor. Because you had to produce, like a glass bottle would have to be produced by hand. So you had to hire a glass blower, and you had to be very skilled. And when they introduce machinery, and then it becomes semi-handmade, well then that cost goes down. And eventually, it gets to the point where originally the bottle cost more to make than what was in the bottle, to now the bottle's a uh, minuscule part of the cost, where right. the product inside the bottle is what's worth it. Yeah. And that uh, occurs because of industrialization, how things are changing, automation. And at this point in history, labor was still relatively uh, cheap. And the end product, or the skill, was what you were selling. And we've come from a nation of producers that are producing goods, uh, mostly goods and materials and some services, to now our economy is more service-based, right. labor, because labor costs so much. Now, uh, what, was the, uh, what was the height of the population here? About 250 at its height. So with this college being built, this would have changed this community from oh, yes, 300 yeah. people to conceivably it, maybe 10,000 people. Easily. You know? if, had the college gone in, it could you have been like a, a miniature version of San Luis Obispo, something like that. Right. The weather here, obviously, most of our valley residents know it, uh, you know, hot, dry summers. Uh, well, we're here today. This is what? January <laughs> yeah. 10th. It's a beautiful day. And it's 
60 degrees out, the sun's out, mm -hmm. so I can see living here in a tent in the winter. Yeah, without I mean, it raining, you know. I mean, yeah, and it's very weather dependent. But yeah. uh, the town could have been completely different. Right, could have been a small uh, college town. It would have had a different atmosphere. Then you would have seen the developments that would have come in later: the water systems, trees, obviously irrigation. And it could have been very different because we are geographically located in the center of California. Right, uh, and people come out here and they say, "Oh, you're you're out in this." Lonely place, you're in the middle of nowhere. I was like, no. Well, it wouldn't have been nowhere if that yeah. college would have been built. This well, would have been on the map. I always view it as you're in the middle of everywhere because where else in California can you be less than two hours from the mountains, two hours from the beach, exactly. two hours from Los Angeles? Yeah. And uh, it's all a matter of attitude. You know? Well, the now original... because of transportation, about 100 years ago, <laughs> yeah, yeah, I, I understand. <laughs> it would have been a lot further. Right. Yeah, I've ridden 40 miles in a day and it ain't fun. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> well, what was the, uh, the town site acreage? It was 160 acres or so? Uh, no, originally they purchased 800 acres, but the original park encompassed the business district of okay. the town, which was 200. So they were able to to do livestock and and uh, and grow their own uh, foods. Livestock, also. Uh, basic farming, uh, garden farming as well. Yeah. Because uh, if at this time in history, if you wanted fresh vegetables, you had to right. grow them your own. They were able to sustain themselves mm -hmm. for the most part. Um, but that acreage shrank after uh, the town started in decline? Um, it started selling off assets? As or? people began moving away, they would sell off their property to some of the larger local farms. That, And in farming, it's all about acreage, especially when you start uh, mechanizing and start bringing in tractors versus doing it by, uh, by horse hand. and plow. Right. Uh, so in order to survive, the bigger farmers had to swallow up the smaller farmers, especially during the Depression as... People got away from farming, uh, or at least African-American families did. They would sell off parts of their land because there was 800 acres purchased, and many people had small lots within the town, but there were a lot of people that were absentee. A lot of African-Americans believed in the town and the effort, but they weren't quite willing to move here yet. Oh, so they hadn't so they pulled buy, the trigger on, on moving yeah, here. Yeah, so they would buy a lot thinking, all right, this is an investment. In the future, I'll move my family and my business here. Because yeah. th if you think about all the things that go into making a town, it's not just like, say, here's a town, everyone come. Right. You have to recruit people that are willing to upplant their family, build a home, right. move their business. And you have to bring in the talent to mm -hmm. be able to sustain the community. I mean, you have Correct. to bring in a doctor, a dentist. You got to bring in uh, all you that know, stuff. Baker and you know, if it was a gold rush, you know, the gold would be here. People would just flock here, yeah. and then the services would come after. Right. Here, you're building it from the ground up, so the services need to be here before the people come in. Yeah, exactly. So it's it is not an easy occupation yeah. to do. We are so. out of time, but uh, uh, briefly tell uh, tell the viewing audience uh, what you offer here at Allensworth as far as. Uh, we have, we're open Friday through Sunday right now because of uh, service reductions. And we, if you call the office ahead of time, you can schedule a tour. You can find us on www.parks.ca.gov. And that has a link to our Facebook page. You can follow us on Facebook and our YouTube channel. And the YouTube channel offers uh, small tours throughout some of the buildings here in the town. Also, there's uh, features uh, our our Muppet of Colonel Allensworth we have that we use with the kids for oh, yeah? educational programs. Yeah. yeah, We have a custom made uh, Muppet. It was made by a puppeteer from Disney for oh, us, wow. special order. And it looks like the Colonel. He goes on some adventures uh, on our YouTube channel, as well as our other special events. We have five major special events with the Friends of Allensworth every year. Uh, the next one will be February 25th at the end of February for Black History Month. We also have a gospel fest that will be coming up in April. Juneteenth, of course, we have our October rededication. Once a quarter, we do our lantern light ghost tours, and we also do uh, stargazing in the summer months. Here comes the train, and we're out of time. Steve Toomey, thanks for being on the valley no today, and uh, have, you, have you run across any ghosts? I, no, not personally. <laughs>